Um, <coughs> Hey, and there's Susie Gant. Okay, good morning, everybody. We're going to go ahead and, and get started here. Um, uh, my name is Stacey Smith. I'm the Director of Outreach and Events for RMI, and thank you very much for joining us for what is the uh, third and uh, four-part series of webinars that uh, RMI is doing with um, uh, Anibon. Um, just a reminder to mute your phones and your computers, and um, you can use the, the chat for the chat section for submitting questions throughout the presentation that we and, and comments too if you just want to make some comments that we'll um, be uh, reviewing throughout the program and um, presenting or talking about towards the end during a Q&A session. Uh, for those of you, of you who may have not have done a uh, Zoom um, uh, webinar before, at the, the bottom of your screen if you hover there, um, a uh, navigation bar pops up and there's a chat um, section there, just click that, and when it pops up, you can input your question and then just hit enter and it submits it. You can either send the question directly to someone or you can just hit everyone and then we'll all see it. And Michelle, our moderator, will be monitoring those to um, pose at the end of the, the program. Um, the, the format for today, um, we are going to hear a brief presentation from our presenter, Anubhan Basu from Sage Policy Group, and then we are going to um, uh, roll into a little bit of uh, Q&A that's moderated by Michelle Welly from Economic Alliance of Greater Baltimore, and then we'll open it up for audience Q&A and comments, like I said, based on the, the chat questions and comments that you all submit. And we're, we're trying something new this uh, for this webinar. We're actually going to do a little bit of polling, and we've got three polling questions. The first two that um, we're going to do before Anubhan speaks, and uh, then one that Michelle's going to present to us. So a little bit more interactive than some of the presentations have been before. Um, before we get into the, the meat of the program, we want to do some sponsor thank yous who've helped us bring this program to all of you. And um, first, we have the Maryland Department of Commerce, represented by Heather Graham. Heather, would you like to say a few words? Sure, thanks so much, Stacey, for the opportunity. And uh, I see a lot of familiar faces on this call, so I, uh, I won't go into a whole lot of detail about commerce, but um, for those who may not be as familiar with us, we are the state's economic development agency, and we have been longtime partners with RMI um, and are you know, excited that uh, they're bringing these opportunities for education to um, our manufacturing community during this challenging time. Um, I will say that um, you may have heard uh, this from Secretary Schultz as well, but we have just been so impressed and thankful for the contributions of our manufacturing community during the COVID response. Uh, whether it's been um, you know, making PPE, we had over 53 grants that we gave out through the COVID manufacturing um, emergency grant program that I had the pleasure of of overseeing with my team um, and some really amazing stories coming out of companies that stepped up, made uh, great investments and um, were able to churn out masks and, and gloves and ventilator parts and so many other critical items during this uh, challenging time. And uh, thanks to our partners in manufacturing, to, to Scott Phillips and, and Mike Galeazzo and Mike Kelleher at NEP for helping get the word out about those grants and referring companies to us. And um, it's, it's been a great experience, um, silver lining through a challenging time. Um, so at any rate, I also see a few members of our Maryland Manufacturing Advisory Board on this call. Uh, so for those who don't know, that is um, a group that the um, Maryland Department of Commerce staffs and the whole purpose is to uh, advise commerce and the state on things that are important to the manufacturing community and uh, so we appreciate uh, Susie and others on the call who are, are part of that group who help uh, provide policy guidance and and, um, and support uh, that helps us do a better job of supporting our Maryland manufacturers so thank you for that and with that I'll turn it back over to you Stacey. Thanks, Heather. Um, next, we have PNC Bank, who's been a sponsor of the uh, full webinar series with us um, and represented by David Schwing. David, would you like to say a few words? I'm looking for him. Did we, are you guys hearing him? No, no. He's on mute. He's on mute. He's on mute. Yeah. Dave, you're on mute. Trying to find him. You got me now? There you yeah. go. Yeah, yeah. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, so thank you, Stacy. Uh, Stacy mentioned I'm Dave Schwing, 
I'm the group manager for PNC in the commercial space. In particular, we work with companies with revenues between five and 50 million. One of the things that PNC has been able to do through this, through this time is really helping companies become more efficient through various treasury products and platforms. And those efficiencies are long lasting. We welcome those conversations with all companies. RMI, its members, and all the participants on today's webinar are so important for a great state of Maryland creating jobs and wealth. So we thank each and every one of you. We're delighted to be a sponsor for today's webinar. So thank you, Stacy, for reaching out to us. Uh, each and every one of us has changed the way we do business. So I encourage all of us to share best practices so we can all become stronger. So on behalf of PNC, we hope everybody continues to be safe and we look forward to the day when we, when we can all get together again. So thanks again, Stacy and Mike. Thanks, David. And uh, next we have Mid-Atlantic Regional Minority Business Development Agency Advanced Manufacturing Center from Baltimore, MBDA as we more lovingly call you, uh, represented by Scott Phillips. Scott, would you like to say a few words? Stacey, you, you're getting that down really well. Um, welcome everyone uh, to the call. And my, my mindset uh, this morning is about um, intentional inclusiveness. Uh, and I just wanna, uh, we've been a partner with, with Mike and RMI since our efforts began five years ago. Um, and I wanna take this opportunity to say thank you to Mike for seeing the vision of being intentionally inclusive. I think most of you recognize um, that there are disparities that exist between the minority community, majority community around access to capital and growing uh, business. Our job is to try to assist with leveling that playing field. Um, and I wanna thank Mike for, and RMI for being that partner and for all of you um, who've supported uh, the MBDA project here in Baltimore. Um, the only other thing I'd like to say is uh, on July the 13th, we will be hosting, and I'm sure RMI will be sharing, we were highlighting through our My Hub Mondays uh, technologies associated with um, healthcare that have been developed by African American uh, uh, entrepreneurs. So I would invite you to participate uh, in that event. And once again, Mike, in our mind, thank you for allowing us to be your partner. Scott, thank great. You, Scott. Thank you for your support. And, and we will definitely um, email a link to that My Hub program when we send out the follow up email to everyone this afternoon. Mm -hmm. Um, last but not least, we have Economic Alliance of Greater Baltimore, who uh, partnered with us on this program, sponsored it, and we have Michelle Welling, CEO, um, uh, moderating our discussion with Anubhan and Mike. And um, Michelle, did you want to say a few words about EAGB before we roll into the program? Stacey, you know, I always want to say a few words about EAGB. Um, first of <laughs> all, uh, R RMI is not only a great partner, they're an essential partner, because manufacturing is one of the strategic industries that's very important to the greater Baltimore region. For those of you who don't know what our region is, it includes Cecil, Carroll, Hartford, Howard Counties, Baltimore City, Baltimore County, and Anne Arundel County. The uh, manufacturing base in, in, in our jurisdictions um, is growing, they're hiring people, and it's also a very diverse manufacturing base in that it runs the gamut from food distribution, uh, and, and manufacturing to biomedical manufacturing and distribution to pharmaceuticals to wind energy um, I just can go on and on and on so it's very important uh, that we all understand um, a lot of what uh, Anubhan is going to present uh, during this session and I have been a participant in all three of these uh, sessions and um, I have learned a great deal and I will guarantee that all of you will learn a great deal as well so welcome Thanks, Michelle. Thanks for your support. Um, what I didn't mention at the beginning of this is that the, these webinars are part of an initiative between RMI and Sage Policy Group and, and its chair um, and uh, CEO uh, on, or President Anubhan Basu. And um, the, um, the, the webinars are just one part of the programming things that you'll see in moving forward. And the initiative is primarily designed to uh, bring the, the manufacturing 
community stakeholders together and galvanize them in support of our industry and um, uh, helping to grow Maryland's economy through uh, manufacturing. So anyway, just wanted to let you know um, why we're doing this and let's roll into our program. Anubhan, do you want to go ahead and share your, your uh, first slide? And I'm going to initiate our um, first poll, which if you all would like to um, check out the poll that I have there, where does Maryland rank against other states in terms of economic output from manufacturing? Take a guess at where, where you think we we rank, and what is the average annual manufacturing job compensation in Maryland? What do you think that number is? I'll wait about another five seconds here. Okay, and Good. Uh, thank you very much, Stacy. Thank you to all the sponsors. Thank you, Mike Galeazzo. Thank you to RMI, EAGB. And I'm so looking forward to my conversation with Michelle Welly. My goal today had been to provide a very short presentation uh, in the range of five or six slides. Uh, I got it down to 14. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the, this whole in initiative is entitled New Directions for Maryland Manufacturing, but my presentation today is entitled Why South Carolina? Why South Carolina? What is it that they offer? Um, South Carolina manufacturing growth, uh, manufacturers in South Carolina account for 16.8% of total South Carolina output in Maryland. If you look to the right-hand column, the corresponding number is 5.9%. Total output for manufacturing in South Carolina was $38.7 billion in 2018. In Maryland, it was $24.3 billion, which means we rank 30th. Uh, in the country in terms of gross manufacturing output, though our population of around 6 million people ranked us 19th. And so manufacturing plays less of a role here, as everyone knows, um, than it does in South Carolina and many other states. Uh, there were an average of 256,000 manufacturing employees in South Carolina in 2019 with average annual compensation around $75,000. There were an average of 108,000 manufacturing employees in Maryland in 2019 with an average annual compensation of nearly $91,000. Now, uh, I like that. I mean, it, you know, if anyone has an incentive to grow manufacturing, you know, between let's say Maryland and South Carolina, it's us. Our workers make more here. So this is about creating more of these types of jobs, but of course it's the South Carolinians who have done a better job creating these kinds of jobs. And we're gonna talk about why that is as we go through this. This is South Carolina manufacturing output in billions of dollars from 2008 to 2018. Looks like a pretty good trend, doesn't it? I like that. Now I'm going to show you Maryland. I'm going to show you Maryland. And guess what? It's the same trend. It can happen here. Now, uh, as it turns out, our trend doesn't really begin this up spike in manufacturing output until roughly 2014 or 2015, whereas it begins about five years earlier than that after the Great Recession in South Carolina. But still, this is impressive. But, as, you know, all, almost with all things, um, there's more than meets the eye here. So if you look at uh, manufactured goods exports, exports abroad. Here's South Carolina's trend back to the year 2000 and through the year 2019. Now, obviously, 2020 is going to change all these trends and global supply chains are fragmenting and the global economy will end up shrinking around 6% this year. We'll understand that. But that's South Carolina. You say, okay, well, I'm going to, you know, he's going to show Maryland next, right? Yes, I am. And the trend is going to be very similar, uh, isn't it? Because it was when we looked at uh, total manufacturing output. Uh, no, it's not. Um, and that's because of the composition of our manufacturing sector. We sell a lot to the federal government. You know, when you think about defense contracting, Northrop Grumman, so on and so forth, and other defense contracts throughout the state, a lot of that manufactured uh, output relates to that segment. Aerospace, in fact, is our number one segment, but a lot of that heads uh, number one manufacturing sector in Maryland, which helps explain, by the way, that lofty compensation because aerospace workers obviously make a lot of money on average. But, uh, but that, you know, we, we don't export a lot. Our exposure to the rest of the world is not very great. Now, when you've got a, a federal government um, that had a $23.5 trillion national debt coming into the crisis, has probably added $4 or $5 trillion more to the national debt since then, when you have a presidential election in November with very uncertain outcomes, there's no guarantee that defense budgets will continue to rise, and therefore Maryland is positioned 
absent intervention for an ongoing upsurge um, in, in manufacturing output. So, I, you know, and we'll come back to this. What are the, some of the drivers of South Carolina's manufacturing growth? According to the South Carolina Manufacturing Alliance, contributing to the state's manufacturing success are business incentives. And we're gonna have a lot, need to have a lot of incentives in Maryland because the supply chain is generally not here. Um, you know, the supply, various supply chains have deteriorated over time. And so we have to induce people to come back and reform those supply chains. A regulatory environment, uh, property, workers, and the long-term cost of doing business. South Carolina's Secretary of Commerce, Bobby Hitt, points to, quote, business-friendly, close quote, regulations and taxation, no state property tax, income tax, or inventory tax. And that helps keep uh, costs low there. Energy infrastructure investments have also been another source of strength for that state's manufacturing sector. According to the U.S. Energy Information Administration, South Carolina's industrial electricity prices are more than 14% lower than the U.S. average, but ours in Maryland are 19% higher. That's a problem because, of course, manufacturing is about transforming inputs to outputs, and that often requires the intervention of lots of energy. And, of course, they have a favorable location. The state is served by five interstate highways, one of the most productive container ports in the U.S., but we can say something very similar to that, can't we? I-70, I-95, I-83, so on and so forth. No advantage for them there. Um, so you know, in many ways, not all, not in terms of the regulatory environment necessarily, not in terms of electricity prices, but we actually facially line up pretty well against a state like South Carolina. They are a right to work state. The states in blue are right to work. States in gray are not. Um, now, does that matter? We can debate that all day. I know a lot of people are very emotional about this issue and really believe that unions have been key to allowing their families to enter the American middle class. I get that. I understand that. But the data are what the data are. Um, when you look at real manufacturing output growth between non-right-to-work states and right-to-work states between 2001 and 2016, which is the graphical element here, right-to-work states saw faster manufacturing output growth. Uh, this comes from the uh, NERA Economic Consulting, uh, National Economic Research Associates Economic Consulting. And so, um, you know, the results are what the results are. And, you know, states like Indiana and Michigan have become right to work in recent years for a reason. And I, I'm not aware of any right to work states that have become non right to work states. Um, you know, and generally, because it, it's, you know, it's generally right to work status is associated with good economic outcomes. Uh, let's look at uh, manufacturing industry health here, shall we? Um, you can see the red is A. States that are in red uh, are, um, uh, are get to receive an A for manufacturing industry health. Uh, states in light blue get a D. We get a D. South Carolina gets an A. Now, what uh, manufacturing industry health variables are included in this uh, construct? The share of total income earned by manufacturing employees in each state, the wage premium paid to manufacturing workers relative to the other states' employees, and the share of manufacturing employment per capita. Uh, now, we can break this down further, this manufacturing scorecard. So you can see there are the D and the A. Maryland gets a D in terms of manufacturing industry health. South Carolina gets an A. And then you can see the rest of it. But look at human capital, which is the third category here. Maryland gets a C. South Carolina gets an F. And we'll talk more about this in a second. For global reach, however, Maryland gets a D. South Carolina gets an A. So, what, so somehow the South Carolinians have linked their manufacturing supply chains to the balance of the uh, global economy. Now, I understand there's all this discussion about reshoring. We actually talked about reshoring in the previous um, uh, webinar, but this global reach is very powerful because the fact of the matter is the global economy, the people of the world, have more buying power than, than does the federal government of the United States. Uh, and so this is one of the ways we want to, do, what, one of the things we want to do, we want to extend ourselves as Marylanders, we're on the East Coast of the United States, Europe, Africa, so on and so forth, not to mention linkages to Asia, you know, we have significant uh, possibilities here. But note that South Carolina is hardly perfect along all these dimensions, and that in fact in some, some categories, Maryland, like productivity and innovation, that category, Maryland ranks higher. And South Carolina has challenges too. Um, in CBER, CBER is a component of Ball State University, in their 2019 Manufacturing Logistics National Report, South Carolina scores declined from the previous year in a number of categories. Fell from B plus to B in diversification, dropped from C to C minus in tax climate, and fell from D minus to F in human capital. Despite all of its advantages and economic development challenges that South Carolina faces, one common among its peers is workforce availability. So watch this. Census data indicate that 87% of South Carolina residents 25 or older have at least a high school diploma, but only 27% of a bachelor's degree or higher. In Maryland, our beautiful state, 90% of residents have at least a high school degree, and nearly 40% have a bachelor's degree or higher. According to Michael Hicks, 
director of the Center for Business Economic Research nationwide, about half of all factory employees have a college degree, leaving South Carolina behind in that manufacturing measurement. Hicks says the demand for better educated, for a better educated workforce will eventually limit expansion of manufacturing in South Carolina. So what's the game here? Well, part of the game here is having that workforce of the future here in Maryland. Then we have a chance of winning. Not to say that we don't have to continue to think about right to work status, energy costs, regulatory environment, tax environment, all those kinds of things matter. We have to get a lot of this right. Though South Carolina stands for the proposition that you don't have to be perfect. So Maryland and manufacturing, we can do this. If we do this right in 10 years, people will be talking about the Maryland miracle, the manufacturing miracle here in Maryland. South Carolina stands for the proposition that we don't have to be perfect, just better than everybody else. This is, you know, the story of the bear in the woods and you and your friend encounter a bear. You just have to outrun him. You don't have to even be that fast. If Mike and I are in the woods, damn straight, I'm running faster than Mike. Uh, but I would not outrun the sponsors. We really like our sponsors. At the heart of the endeavor is creating the manufacturing workforce of the future. This will help unite us politically, but also we need to be our best. Look, why do I say unite us politically? If we buy into the stereotype that Democrats favor labor and, and Republicans or conservatives favor business, and you can agree with that or not agree with that, but if we're training workers, that's good for labor, that's good for workers, but it's also good for business. There doesn't have to be um, any kind of division here. We should be able to do this together. This should unite us. And then Wayne Gretzky, of course, great hockey player, married to a model, says, quote, skate to where the puck is going, not where it has been, close quote. And we know where the puck is going to support a more highly educated workforce. Let's get there first. And let's unite ourselves politically in the process and create a much larger middle class as well. And so that's uh, my commentary. And Michelle, I throw it over to you. I guess I have to unmute now. Um, you know, one of the things that in addition to the growth industry sectors that the Economic Alliance follows, um, we also pay a lot of attention to talent and workforce. Because without, to your point, Arnavon, without talent and workforce, you can only grow so much and then you're stuck. So Mike, um, as, as, as Arnavon talks about new directions for, for Maryland manufacturing and the Maryland miracle, what does that mean in terms of, of, of the workforce challenge for this region and the state? Well, first of all, uh, um, thanks, Michelle. Uh, Anna Bond, you, you always get me so excited. Um, I'm always on, on for manufacturing, but you put me on super speed. Let me just say this. Uh, it's very clear there's a new reality out there. And RMI has always been about promoting the future for Maryland manufacturing for the purposes of jobs and community. So New Directions is simply about our economy, which Annabon just addressed. And I must add to that, Annabon, that we're gonna have a lot of industries in Maryland that have been fueling our economy in the past that won't be around in the present. So there's the opportunity for manufacturing. Aside from what you laid out for workforce, there's gonna be a large number of folks, an increasing number of folks that are unemployed who could find avenues of opportunities to that $91,000 compensation. I mean, it's a wonderful time for the state to recognize that manufacturing should be a priority. It's going to help our economy. It's going to help our unemployment. And ultimately, and Scott Phillips, kind of getting back to you, it's going to improve our communities. So that's kind of my message. Never has there been a better time. And Senator Chris West is on, a, is, is, is on this uh, webinar. Uh, Chris, there's never been a better time for Maryland public policymakers to take a look at how we need new directions for Maryland's economy, for our economic engine. And manufacturing clearly must be a priority. Thank you, Michelle. OK, so. Um Stacy, I'm going to go off script just really quickly on this issue of workforce. Um, and Mike, uh, we've talked about this before. Uh, manufacturing is not viewed widely as an industry that young people want to go into. So um, as, assuming that we're developing jobs, assuming <clears throat> that uh, uh, there's a great deal of focus on uh, manufacturing as a growth industry, how do we convince kids who are in middle school, um, high school, et cetera, that this is an industry they should be looking at? Well, this may surprise you, but I'm not, I think the focus right now, because of this new reality, our, my major job is to give manufacturers workers right now. I have a company in Baltimore County right now that's got about 50 employees, eight, eight job openings. So I would say this large increase in the unemployed is a wonderful pull 
for matching up with these jobs that are out there. So that's one. Concurrently, we need to certainly uh, look at how we reach out to younger people. And quite frankly, I think whatever we've done in the past, and there's been enormous efforts, I mean, with NAM and everybody, and reaching out to students, and quite frankly, there's not been a lot of success. So I think we probably need to think about new ways of engaging, engaging with school systems so that the teachers can understand the fourth industrial revolution and what the fact that manufacturing is technology. And that's the student's sweet spot because they do know technology. So that's my thoughts that we do concurrently, but we really go after those people that are unemployed. We need to get them back to work. Great, uh, th thanks Mike, I appreciate that. Um, we're gonna present another polling question and this is just asking for everybody's opinion. Uh, and, and Stacy, do you put that up? I am. Yep. Okay. So, what degree? To what degree do you think um, our local and state elected officials really understand the value of manufacturing to our economy and are ready to support it? All right. We might not be able to do this one. <laughs> Wait. Maybe. No. Guys, I am so sorry. Our second poll. I. Oh. Wait, wait, wait. Here we go. Okay. We have faith in you, you Stacy. There we go. Yep. yep, it's yeah. there. It's there. Okay, all of you on the call, it's time to vote. <laughs> okay, I'll wrap it up in three seconds. Yeah. Can you see it? Uh, yep. Yeah. yeah. It looks like the winner is somewhat. <laughs> somewhat at 46%, yeah. not at all at 37%, and a great deal at 17%. But it's tilted more towards not at all versus a great deal. And so uh, yeah. the winner is, you know, and, and not at all captures nearly two in five respondents, not at all. Interesting, very interesting. So, so given that, um, Anubhan, you said that manufacturing is a wealth producing industry. How do we convince you know, state and local governments that that's true and that it really is a growth industry that's worth supporting and how to make it a priority? Well, I mean, what do they talk about? They talk about wanting people to make a living wage. They talk about that all the time. Well, you know, we've been debating in this state about a $15 an hour minimum wage set to go into effect 2025, 2026. That 90,000 average wage, that's $45 an hour with benefits. You know, that's, that, you have to talk about debated minimum wage when you've got that kind of job. So it's, it's, it's about the money. It's about the jobs and opportunity. And, you know, um, a lot of manufacturing jobs, even though increasingly they require college degrees, it's still the case that some meaningful fraction of manufacturing jobs allow a person to enter the middle class without a college degree. It is still the case. Uh, it's becoming more difficult, that's true, but it's still the case. And, and of course, tax base, economic diversification. I mean, we Marylanders are sitting on a ticking time bomb. You know, we know that Medicare is set to go insolvent in 2026. You know, the federal government's gonna have to cut back on spending at some point, and Maryland is not ready. We need different drivers of economic activity going forward. Manufacturers, one of them, because it's a wealth creating industry. And by that, I mean that, you know, I'm a service provider. I'm an economist. I sit in front of a computer all day. I create no wealth for the society, zero. I spend money as it turns out, but I don't create any wealth for the society. Manufacturers do by transporting inputs that aren't that valuable as inputs in and of themselves into outputs that are very valuable. And you know, final thing, Michelle, about this, um, you know, you had asked Mike the question, well, what's going to take to get middle schoolers and high schools excited, high schoolers excited about this? Look, say, what kind of phone do you have? Apple? I got an iPhone. Do you know what Apple is? No, they're a manufacturer. And what kind of car do you want to drive, Gen Z, when you grow up? We want to drive Teslas. Do you know what Tesla is? They're a manufacturer. So all the things that you think are cool, they're manufacturers. So think about it for your vocation. Interesting. That's a really interesting perspective. Um, and I know that we, 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 we deal with that perception issue with um, uh, companies that are uh, 
in the medical device um, arena, that are in the pharmaceutical arena, and you're right, they are also manufacturers, very high, highly technological. Um, I think that, uh, Stacy, are we ready for to look at the chat questions? Yep, Mike, did you wanna add any comments to what Anubhan said? Well, what I wanna mention, again, the, the poll I think is probably reflective of, of many, many people that, um, and I understand it, having 30 years supporting manufacturing, there were other key and emerging industries in Maryland that, that, that took off, and I get that. But now we need to go back and get people to rethink what that future looks like. Uh, for the last two years, I've been down in Annapolis talking with legislators, particularly the newly elected Democratic legislators and, and uh, Montgomery County in particular, uh, to help them understand what manufacturing is. So I, I think we it's not about criticizing people, it's gonna be about educating them. And the key message is manufacturing is technology. Manufacturing 4.0 is the future of manufacturing and it's a new definition of manufacturing. Annabon, do you, do you agree? I agree, you know, all the things they care about, alternative energy, right, you know, uh, you know, solar arrays and wind turbines, those come out of the manufacturing process. You're right, manufacturing and technology go hand in hand, but somehow, there are people out there, young people included, who think that manufacturing is one thing, it's the old world, and technology is the new world, and they're just a different world. They're the same world. So that's part of the message. You're absolutely correct. Thanks, Michelle. Great. Um, well, we have, a, we have a fair number of, of, of questions here, as well as some observations. And I, and I want to, to comment on the one observation, or not comment, that bring to your attention, the one observation um, about the fact that um, we have a lot of people unemployed. Um, and we have the unemployment uh, benefit with the extra $600 a week ending today, absent something unusual happening on, uh, <laughs> in the federal government. So you, you have uh, manufacturing uh, companies as well as um, uh, uh, logistics and distribution companies who have job openings, but not getting a lot of applicants and having, having you know, jobs going you know, on, you know, empty for long periods of time. So you know, how, how do we make that um, better known that there are opportunities for, this is a bit of a rhetorical question because we've talked about this, there are opportunities out there for jobs that provide more than a living wage, that provide for career advancement, um, and they're available, you need to apply. So that's, I mean, that, that's a, again, a gap in communication and awareness of what this industry is all about. Um, if anybody wants to comment on that, please, you know, please, unmute your mic um, and chime in. Um, also, uh, we've been talking about technology uh, and the importance of um, technology to the manufacturing industry. And another comment was that knowing technology and knowing how to effectively apply it is, um, is completely different. There's a gap there. So again, I think that's a workforce issue. As, as well as an employer issue, understanding what technologies are needed to advance your company and what skill sets are needed in the workers that you already have, your incumbent workers, if they're gonna progress, as well as the workers you want to recruit to your jobs. Well, Michelle, let me just uh, jump in. Uh, you know, I mean, it is very difficult, do you hear me? It's very difficult for these manufacturers to cobble together the workforce. I mean, they'll tell you, I mean, um, you know, what fraction of the people who apply for jobs with them fail their drug test? You know, they, you know, or, you know, I just, just cannot for whatever reason pass muster. So part of it is a lack of awareness uh, in the workforce that these opportunities exist. A part of it is a lack of, for whatever reason, the ability of people to access these opportunities even when they are aware of them. Part of it is because, um, you know, we have some impediments that we have created. I'll give you an example. I, just wrote the economic development strategy for Somerset County, Maryland. And uh, Somerset uh, has a manufacturer known as Rubber Set. I believe they're part of the Sherwin Williams family. And I spoke to the general manager there, very nice person, and said, you know, look, we've got these jobs that go begging, $20 an hour. And we asked people in the community, you know, would you be interested in being trained for this kind of job? And they said, look, $20 an hour sounds fine, but if I get that job, I lose my housing subsidies, I lose my food stamps, I lose all these kinds of benefits. It's not worth it for me. So we've created some significant barriers and also a lack of fundamental awareness about these opportunities. And so here we are, but we have to change that. That's what this is about. We have to go where the puck is going. And you know, 
We got, that's why we're having this conversation. Not because we're, we've reached our destination, but we have to begin heading there. Hey, let me just, uh, uh, Annabon, I agree. Uh, thanks for, we are talking about new solutions to a new direction. I think talking about what we've tried in the past is probably meaningless at this point. We need to be architects of our future. We need to work with what we have. And I'm gonna tell you, the person that's dealing with a mortgage who used to work at a restaurant may be very interested in that $91,000 annual compensation. I think there are many people, that single mom that was working at, at, a, at a store that lost her job, now more than ever, we need to get the message out about the kind of jobs. I can tell you the other thing, manufacturers, and Phil Talkoff is on here, and he made a point. Right now, we're paying people a lot of money to be unemployed, and I get that. That's gonna change, okay? Because we should be paying, we're paying good money for people to be employed in manufacturing. But the most important point, I think, is that we're a new reality, new directions. We need to have new kinds of conversations. Who would have ever thought the federal government was gonna be propping up our economy the way they are today. And I'm not saying that's good or bad, but it is definitely different. And that's how I think we need to be thinking about the opportunities of the future. We need a coalition of the willing. Those people that are no longer willing to accept the past, but are geared up for creating the future. So, you know, we've got, and in, 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 in the greater Baltimore region, and I'm going to speak to that more than the entire state right now, we, we, we have um, a strong manufacturing industry. Um, and we have uh, a, a couple of jurisdictions that are getting it right. Baltimore County um, has the, the, the largest number of manufacturers in the entire state. Um, I think, uh, well, I know Will Anderson's on, you know, uh, you know, on this um, webinar. I think I saw Chris Moyer. Um, yep. Cecil County is, is growing, you know, both its distribution logistics uh, industry, as is Baltimore County, as well as manufacturing. So why, why are we getting manufacturing growing in at least these two jurisdictions, and there are others as well, um, in spite of the challenges with um, uh, uh, lining up with the taxes and cost of energy, et cetera, that we're, we're dealing with and competing with the Southeast, particularly South Carolina? but also the workforce is issues. So Will and Chris, if you wanna chime in here um, about the magic formula, if you have one, that'd be great. Sure, Will, I'll defer to you alphabetically, if nothing else. <laughs> <laughs> Nicely played, Chris. Uh, well, I think, you know, we've, we've had all through COVID, we've had uh, everyone who's inquiring about business has come, come our way when they're talking about manufacturing because we, we have a very healthy set of manufacturers. McCormick has continued to hire. Uh, BD has continued to hire. Several of our smallers have continued to hire that we've been, been trying to help them on their frontline technical work. So we have the legacy of very strong uh, manufacturers and a strong port, <clears throat> but we share the same conditions of, uh, do we have enough people coming in? And the answer is, the answer is no. I'm not talking about COVID. You know, we will we will come out of COVID. We will come out of these conditions where the the, the pandemic unemployment stipend is is flipping industries like restaurants and and lower wage jobs. But um, it's an ongoing problem, and we you know Mike and and a lot of people on this call have been working on this issue actually for better than a decade to get people into uh, into the space. I think technology is actually the answer. And some of us who run workforce systems uh, need to, on the other side of COVID, we need to be a lot faster uh, about it. We need to find ways to, to, to take on real issues. Like, I mean, what Anibon was talking about, but I know another issue I've heard at RMI is um, apprenticeships work, but they don't work for employers because employers don't want to foot the bill to train somebody who's going to jump immediately. So there's, there's system changes that we need to take on. It's not just, do folks at the state appreciate uh, um, the industry? We need to take on the systemic problems around recruiting and training people uh, so that employers can partner because that's the key. Yeah, that's is gr all great points, Will. I would add to that Cecil County, um, so Maryland, um, Maryland labor force, 4.1% of Maryland's labor force is in, at, at a manufacturer. Here in Cecil County, 14.9% of our labor force is at a manufacturer, whether it's north of Grumman, Tarumo, 
um, W.L. Gore, uh, so some of our smaller, uh, leaner, meaner, greater uh, businesses as well. But, you know, Mike Galeazzo and I were trading emails about this earlier today about our employee, you know, his members don't need to talk about the workforce pipeline right, right now. They need, they need employees today. And I totally get that. But without addressing the, the workforce pipeline, without a, teaching a parent that it's not a dirty job to have their middle school kid or high school kid potentially interested in it. I think the one thing that um, the education system could do better statewide is not just talk about, hey, if you, you're interested in this kind of widget or the, if you have this aptitude, here's what, it, here's what you could do. Sell the, the career, not just the job. Talk about full medical benefits. 401k at eight, you know, we have employers here in Cecil County that if you are age 18 can show up on time, not high and can operate a DeWalt, uh, Baltimore County plug there for you, Will, a DeWalt power cordless drill, they'll teach you everything else and you will have make $50,000 out of the gate with full benefits. And uh, our school of technology, the Cecil County School of Technology at the high school level is creating a manufacturing program and rather than just propping the kids up and they need to find, you know, leave the nest on their own, we are making and bringing the big employers, the Northrop Grumman's, the W.L. Gore's, the Tarumos, to the table to help those kids through the pipeline in their edu educational stage so that they are there right when that kid crosses that stage and does this with the tassel, hopefully in person and not virtually next year. They're in place to then take that, that talent right into their um, employment and that, you know, that's a lot like the apprenticeship program, but employers are going to have to get their hands dirty. You can pay a consultant $40,000 to find the person, or you can pay less than that to, to bring them in at a younger age and, and take a chance. And um, sorry if I feel too strongly about that. Well, one of the things, Michelle, that relates to this, I want to mention because we're really talking about the image of manufacturing. Uh, two years ago, RMI uh, created a partnership with Maryland Public Television to do a 13-part series on Maryland manufacturing, and that's still in the works, okay? They're out there raising the money to, to do uh, a program similar to the Farm and Harvest where they go inside of manufacturing and they, and they talk about, they, or at least help people see that. That'll help parents and other people understand better, you know, what, what manufacturing looks like under the hood. So, but yeah, I, I think, think I, I forgot about that, Mike, but I think you're absolutely right. Looking forward to, to seeing that get launched. Um, and, Hopefully they put that on YouTube and not just MPT. So yeah, under 50. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, the other part of that, Chris, and uh, you know, let's not spend too much time on this, is there's a whole educational component that we're developing that will be made available online for the schools, for the kids in the pipeline. Mike, this is Sandra Lamb from uh, Central. Uh, I lost you. From where, Sandra? We from lost you. Rex. Oh, hi, Sandra. Hi. Listen, Chris, I really appreciated the comments that you made and, and Will, and I wanna put this in. I do think that we have to have a different mindset. And Anaban, if we think about the fact that we have people that would prefer to re receive welfare checks and sit at home and not do anything, we're really looking at a percentage that does not reflect those who go out and have, have worked hard or were prepared and have nowhere to go. Honestly, I'm going to say a, a word here, but in the in full disclosure and um, and trust, we've had conversations on individual basis like this, but not as this group. But there is a stigma that we're talking about that has to do with people who have been blocked, who have gone and prepared, who have done everything that they can do, but those opportunities have historically been not been available to them, and there is a pall as a result of that. So you have the, the piece to overcome that if I do go through this, I will be given a, a, a fair consideration, um, you know, a, a proper consideration. And that is a stigma that we have to keep addressing as leaders in this manufacturing. And that's why I like, Chris, what you were saying with respect to making that personal uh, effort. When, when leadership in manufacturing 
goes out and brings someone in and says, or, or people that have historically not been at the table, bring them in and help them to, at, at whatever appropriate time it is, college, uh, high school or whatever, and show that they can contribute and that they are um, as welcome as anyone else, this will start to turn and you'll have another level of people who are prepared and can contribute uh, that will add to our, our employment base. Just I'm saying. Very, very timely and cogent uh, remark, Sandra. Um, and you know, for what you're saying and, and Chris, which, which you've also mentioned, um, it's clear that there's work to be done in creating a pipeline starting from you know middle school on up so that we're constantly churning out individuals you know with a high school diploma with a community college diploma with a credential whatever it might be to feed uh, the manufacturing industry however if we're trying to help the manufacturers that we have here now who have job openings yeah. um, that are going you know vacant uh -huh. and we're trying to attract more manufacturers to the region um, you know, what do we, how do we do that? How do we market this re I should say the region, but the entire state, I'm sorry, you know, I'm greater Baltimore, you know, all cards on the table here, but the entire state, but significantly the, the, the region, how do we attract more manufacturers here when we have a problem with workforce, when we have a regulatory environment and, and somebody has brought this uh, up on the chat, um, we have a regulatory environment that um, is not conducive to, to bringing more manufacturers here. So what's the, what's the marketing challenge? And I'm asking this for Economic Alliance as well, because we market our industries. What's the marketing challenge to, to even the playing field? Arne Bon, you touched on a lot of this. You know, how do we make sure that people understand that it's not just about the cost of energy, it's not just about uh, the regulatory environment um, or whether you're a right to work state or not. It's about more than that. No, I think what this conversation is making clear. I really like what Sandra said, by the way. And, you know, I, growing up in this country, I always, I, the presumption for me personally was, if I work hard, I'll be rewarded for that. So, but I understand very clearly that there are people who, for whatever reason, history, background, whatever, might say, look, no matter what I do, I'm not going to make it. I, the opportunity is denied to me. Uh, and so that, that's, that clearly that's a, very big challenge and manufacturing is part of the solution, right? Because manufacturing for generations, past generations at least, was the sector where, it, you know, it's, it's, it's standing in the community. It, it represented a promise, right? I don't know if anyone's heard the song Allentown by Billy Joel, he gets exactly at this, right? Past generations, they look to manufacture, lift them to the middle class. When those jobs disappeared, hope, you know, hope in Allentown disappeared or hope in Baltimore, where it happens to be. So I agree, a lot of this has to do with messaging and we have to start with the young folks. And, you know, again, we, we've talked about this, a lot of folks, you know, sort of they raise their eyebrows when you mention the Kerwin Commission's recommendations, the cost of education, implementing those solutions, so on and so forth. But um, one of the things that Kerwin offers is a second pathway to high school graduation, vocational certificates. Now that represents a brand new direction or a possibility of a brand new direction for Maryland manufacturing and workforce development. So we've got some promise here, some hope. Not necessarily the resources, but, but we, I think we have some potential here. But let me let me let me jump in with that. I think you had a slide earlier that talked about South Carolina and Maryland, and that it's the educational level. Uh, you know, MIT just came out with a report last fall. It's called the Work of the Future, and they're talking about all industries, and they're fundamentally talking about the impact of technology on what the world of work is going to look like. And essentially what they're saying is that there's that it's going to be more automated, more high tech driven, and that the good paying jobs of the future. And Sandra, here's the point. It's going to be about tech, uh, technology. You have to have a, you, you're, you know, you're going to be required to have higher level learning in order to go after the better paying jobs in America and the very near future. You know, artificial intelligence is clearly going to displace a lot of middle jobs. So I would encourage, and they would, they also encourage, you know, we need to have academic programs in schools that help students gain a knowledge on technology. Now, RMI believes that our future student base are STEM students, and we've never deviated from that. And, and, I, and I think that's consistent with what MIT is saying. 
So there's going to be, MIT says there's going to be a lot of jobs in the future, high paying jobs, there'll be a scarcity of workers. So the opportunity is to get our, our, uh, those folks that are ready for those jobs, understanding what the world of work looks like inside of manufacturing. It is not about getting the workers of the past, it's about the workers of the future. Can, can I comment? Yes, Susie. Please, Susie. Susie. Hi, Susie, Please. how are you? Good, good to see everyone. I, you know, I mean, really see everybody. I, I think <laughs> we're talking about two, a couple of time frames, and we're talking about an industry in transition, right? Yes. So for the folks that have already, so we have kind of two that are existing, one that are um, utilizing legacy skills where people are actually doing the work, and the other where actually people are managing the machines that are doing the work, and we're in transition. So, um, so in that transition, the short-term problem is this thing right now of unemployment and matching skills with jobs. So it's largely a matching exercise in yes. the immediate right now, right? And so, and there are lots of, there are several strategies by which other industries have utilized more efficient means to match in terms of skill sets, in terms of other, you know, on the larger professional picture, we use LinkedIn, but there isn't its manufacturing corollary to say, here are the skills that I have and the credentials I have, and here's the jobs that are open, and here's that matching exercise, which can be more efficient. So that one of the things that one can do is to create something that is more efficient in terms of its matching of supply and demand. The second thing is, you know, clearly there's going to be a dislocation of legacy labor and a reallocation of new labor required as we look at robotics, digitization, material science, you know, uh, software engineering, all the things that are required for the next level of manufacturing. And, and with that, you know, Maryland is, it, it, you know, Maryland has lots of assets that are, um, that are not deployed currently in terms of, you know, engineers, technology, material science, schools, all the stuff, software, software above, um, here in this area, this region and other. And, and again, uh, it was interesting in terms of the survey that said, what was it, about 80% don't understand, is somewhat or don't understand it all from a legislative perspective what that means as an industry. And so for us, I think that the short term, there are things that we can do to be able to help in this matching exercise and help in terms of Votech of legacy stuff. But I think that if you think about where Adaban said, I love that Wayne Gretzky quote, which, you know, go to where you're going. It's clear where it's going. The question is um, how we get there as both um, employers, as uh, folks that are in um, areas of influence that can help create this ecosystem. And that's, there are a lot of pieces to putting that together with longer term commitments required in order to do that if Maryland is really wanting to play in, in, that, in that area. But there's clearly opportunity. And what's interesting on about in your slide, and I thought this was kind of interesting, when you looked in your slide of the states that were, got an A for manufacturing, it was interesting to me that it wasn't the states at the lowest tax base or to lowest tax rate. It was, it was kind of an interesting, wow, that, that was a surprise to me. It wasn't Texas who was a C or a Florida that was a D. It was, it was other states in terms of their prowess and contribution. So I thought that was kind of interesting just, to, you know, as a, as a litmus. So I guess the question I would say is, how do we play in this transition today? And how do we transition this so that, again, the pieces are in place or the acknowledgement of those pieces so we can pull something together if, 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 if in fact, um, you know, the state, the, the ecosystem of, of contributors are serious about wanting to create this, a manufacturing, you know, sent Maryland as a manufacturing hub. So, sorry. Uh, great observations, uh, Susie. I do think it needs to, there needs to be a, a, a very broad based collaborative effort um, to hit all the points that you mentioned, you know, from, from workforce to policy, um, uh, to facilities, uh, to energy, um, uh, not to be trite, but you know, it, take, it, it, take, it takes a village. It's not any one particular organization's responsibility uh, to be able to pull this all together. Um, I know our, our, our time is, is, is getting a little short and there's, there's, there's a comment on, on the uh, chat that is very intriguing in lots of ways. Um, uh, Chris, no, it's Ken, has asked a question um, about uh, the fact that both Chris and Will um, uh, have mentioned, you know, large manufacturers um, uh, in their counties, and we know, you know, that we, we've got the Amazons of the world, you know, throughout the region, including Baltimore City, certainly Lion Brothers, Stanley Black and Decker. 
but we also have a lot of small and mid-sized manufacturers. So what, what can be done to establish collaborations between some of the large you know, behemoth manufacturing uh, of, of concerns and some of the smaller manufacturers, either uh, uh, in, in a true partnership or some type of collaboration, sharing of, of an employee pool. But, but how, how, do we, how do we get um, uh, the small and mid-sized manufacturers, how do we strengthen that base as well as the large manufacturers? Well, what about sharing costs? like labor costs, energy expenses, capital expenses? Anybody have a thought on that? The easiest way, Michelle Sonibon, the easiest way is large manufacturers and small manufacturers are connected through the supply chain often, right? We're busy, people are busy doing what they do, you know, and so we can talk about partnerships and they're important, don't get me wrong, there's chambers of commerce and there's EAGB and so on and so forth. But at the end of the day, if I'm a large manufacturer, what am I looking for? Partners who can be part of my supply chain, who can efficiently, effectively deliver. That's it. That's one of the reasons. I mean, Susie Gans always makes great points. I'm very jealous. But, you know, she points out that some <laughs> of the states with A's are like Indiana, Michigan, Kentucky, Iowa. Why is that? They have very rich supply chains in manufacturing. So that's food processing in Iowa or auto manufacturing in Michigan, Indiana, so on and so forth, and Kentucky. But, um, but they have, you know, and that's what we need to do. We need to rebuild that supply chain, you know. And again, Wayne Gretzky, we want to go to where the, the puck is going. We know where it's going. It's going to a more highly educated manufacturing, more capital intensive manufacturing in the future. Let's get there. That means tax policy, regulatory policy, infrastructure investment, so on and so forth. But that's where you get partnerships, really. You know, supply chain. You're part of my supply chain. You're one of my suppliers. And I, I strengthen you by purchasing from you. You strengthen me by supplying to me. And that's the number one factor, I think. Ani, Ani, um, excuse me. Did you hear my question, Michelle? My uh, my last comment about sharing co uh, sharing calls. Uh, yes, and I think you know Ani Von, I asked if anybody had a comment on that, and, and Ani Von oh, chimed in on, on, on it. that in terms of in terms of supply chain. Which okay. Is an effective way of getting the large manufacturers, any large company, frankly, um, to, to 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 work collaboratively with smaller companies and. Anibon, you mentioned supply chain. Uh, uh, the Economic Alliance issued its uh, uh, June uh, newsletter last week. It's focused on logistics, but it talks a lot about supply chain and, and, and looking at the national commentaries on um, what's happened during the pandemic. And as a result of the pandemic, there was a lot, there's a lot of commentary from experts out there that companies, because you know, whether we have another pandemic or whether it's a terror, a trade war, or whatever it might be, that interruptions to the to the, the supply chain, companies that show res more resilience in, uh, in facing these types of interruptions are companies that diversify and understand their supply chains. So that if one, if one route dries up, there's another five that can fill in. So, so understanding that supply chain all the way down the line, to, you know, is, is really important. Veronica, and I think that's a, a way of for small, small and mid-sized manufacturers to understand their role in working with some of the larger companies and vice versa, um, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, so that they're all you know, part of that supply chain so nobody, nobody gets impacted uh, you know, uh, to the extent of going out of business when faced with another huge disruption, which is, you know, we're a global economy, it's gonna happen. And Ver Veronica asked the question about sharing costs. If you're, if you're going, there's one place to share costs this was training the labor force, training the workforce, right? So we need to stand up some apprenticeship programs. And, you know, I, I think it was uh, Will Anderson who pointed out uh, that, uh, you know, there's a disincentive for a manufacturer, any business to train their staff because they're worried that that staff is going to jump, you know, as soon as they're trained up. And so, and so because of that, uh, it makes sense to have a partnership where, you know, we create a larger workforce and then people will basically bid on that human capital. And that's a way for, large businesses, small businesses to share costs in the, in, in, the, in the endeavor to create a 21st century manufacturing workforce here in Maryland. Um, Stacy, it looks like we're, we're hit, hitting the witching hour. Um, you know, I had one more thought and then I'll just turn it over to you and, and I don't know if anybody wants to, to comment on this at, at all. And like Veronica, just, just, just a little bit along your, your lines. 
you know, we all focus on, on, on the large companies, you know, whether it's logistics, distribution, warehousing, manufacturing. We also know that there are many small manufacturers um, that are very critical to the economy. Uh, and when we look at locations like Baltimore City, where you don't have a lot of land for large, you know, uh, large manufacturing, you do have opportunities, you know, whether it's through the maker movement um, or having small manufacturers take space in small urban, urban buildings, frankly, that'll never be able to house a large manufacturer. Mm -hmm. so, I, so I think understanding that continuum from the, you know, the, the very small micro manufacturers all the way up to the 800 pound gorillas is important to create a region-wide, statewide uh, network of manufacturers um, that are healthy and constantly hiring people that are coming through the pipeline. Hey, um, Michelle, I absolutely agree with the idea that some of the space that's going to be made available because of the economy could be re, re can, can be used for other purposes, not only for manufacturing, but possibly even for educational sites where schools can accommodate large numbers of people in one location. Um, I, uh, I, I do want to raise a point, uh, Anna Bond, real quick, uh, I'm kind of going back, but Senator Chris West asked me a, que asked a question about electric rates in South Carolina and uh, generally commenting on, do our electric rates hamper the growth of, of manufacturing in Maryland and businesses in general, I guess? No, I think so. I mean, part of being a profit maximizer is being a cost minimizer. And uh, we need electric uh, electricity and some activities are more energy intensive than others. Manufacturing stand, you know, is one of those segments, perhaps the most energy intensive segments in the economy. And so, yeah, of course it matters. Now, are there ways to deal with that? I think so. Uh, you know, we're seeing enormous gains in the prowess of solar and wind energy to drive down uh, cost their own uh, you know, personal cost curves. And, and then, of course, we know that natural gas prices should be very, very low, and we happen to be sitting in or adjacent to the Marcellus Shale Formation. So we got to, you know, we, but we've got to focus more attention on that and in containing those costs so that we can, you know, attract enough manufacturers to rebuild supply chains and, and get, you know, the folks in South Carolina are in trouble. That's what I'm trying to say, Mike. They're in trouble, and they know it. They know that as manufacturing changes, their workforce is not up to it. I, I, uh, and they've I got agree. A problem. Yeah, they're not up to, you say, how is South Carolina in trouble, Anibon? They've got that BMW factory in Spartanburg. They got Boeing in Charleston. They're not in trouble. We're in trouble. Yeah, we're both in trouble. But, you know, we, um, we can get there. We know what we need to do to get there. And uh, I think we can get there faster than South Carolina, believe it or not. And we have the ingredients for success because we are a state of innovation. We're a state of highly educated people. We have a wonderful, uh, you know, educational system. What we don't have is those wonderful resources connected to manufacturing and public policy, Chris, and uh, that says manufacturing is important in Maryland's economy. And I'm at Chris West, not, not Chris Moyer. But we have the ingredients. My God, what we invent in Maryland, we should make in Maryland. Think of all the money that's going to research in Maryland. These are people that are making, thinking up what needs to be made, and then it goes to California. My gosh, it should go to Maryland. It should go to Trade Point Atlantic. <laughs> You're right. We should have pharmaceutical manufacturing plants dotted across the state. I mean, we do the research. FDA is here. NIH is here. Johns Hopkins is here. University of Maryland is here. Where are they? You know. We do. Uh, yeah, yeah. That's a huge issue. We don't have the we don't have the life science well, lab space even for small um, uh, companies, let alone large pharmaceuticals. Well, Michelle, I think that's what the, I think what we're getting at here. And Susie Gans, you so eloquently defined why we're doing new directions. We're finding new ideas and new ways of organizing to make Maryland, hopefully, a national showcase for next generation advanced manufacturing. It's very doable. And Michelle, we're so happy we have you on board with us to do this and commerce and other folks as well. Stacy, does that wrap it up? Oh, Stacy. It sure does. Yes. Thank you to, to you, Anibon, Mike, um, and all our sponsors and partners for today's program. Um, we will be sending um, a, a, record, a link to the recording for today's program, contact information for our sponsors and partners, and Anibon slides out to you this afternoon in an email. Uh, I did want to let you know that our, our fourth and final uh, 
planned webinar will be um, in July. It was originally scheduled for July 15th. We're looking at moving it to the end of the month. It's a manufacturers only program and it is a, a focus group that will be led by Audubon um, to talk more about growing Maryland manufacturing. So we encourage all of you who are manufacturers to uh, uh, visit rmiofmaryland.com and um, register to join us for that program. Thanks all, have a great day. So long everybody, thank, thank you. you. Thank you.